All right, well, thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Dan Meyer. I'm editor in chief here at RCR Wireless News. And uh, today we are Jeff, uh, joined by uh, Jeff Edlund, who's the CM, CMS CTO at Hewlett Packard Enterprises, to talk a bit about the company's work in the service assurance space. So, Jeff, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much. Glad to be here. Well, you know, maybe we start off with a little overview on kind of what uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprises does in terms of uh, the service assurance space as it targets the, uh, the service, service provider market. Yeah, sure. So, um, HP Enterprise, in particular my business, the communications and media solutions business, we um, have a full OSS suite of assurance and fulfillment. If you were to look at us on the assurance side of the equation, you'd see that we have about 30 years of experience mm -hmm. providing solutions to telecoms. Um, we've deployed over four, 500 projects over those years. Um, if you were to take a look at kind of active customer support contracts, we have about 150 customers that are actively using our assurance products today. Mm -hmm. And the mix between those would be about 30% on the fixed uh, wireline side and then 70% on the mobile side. And uh, currently, if you looked at all of our customer contracts, you'd see that we've got coverage in about 53 countries. So. Mm -hmm. Definitely a global operation, uh, lots of customers, um, you know, assurances. Uh, it's a big deal for us and for our customers. Gotcha, gotcha. And I guess, obviously, you guys have a lot of uh, customers out there, like you said, and a lot of uh, kind of region of the market there. I guess what kind of, I guess, from your guys' point of view, what makes HPE, uh, I guess, unique in the market in terms of its service assurance uh, platform? Well, I think what makes us unique is that um, we're not a closed, completely vertically integrated uh, ecosystem. Mm -hmm. You know, while we, pl uh, you know, while we provide uh, SLA management, you know, fault performance management, um, orchestration and automation, quality management, um, customer experience management, all the pieces that you need for a full assurance stack. Um, we don't force our customers to buy that whole stack. Mm -hmm. So you would see as you looked across, um, you know, those customers that we have, that there's a variety of, of them. You, know, my, you might find one customer that consumes the whole stack from us, and then you'd find a lot that consume just fault management. Mm -hmm. It seems to be a, a space where, you know, we've got a really good product and uh, it's differentiated and customers really like that from us. We comply to uh, TM forum frameworks. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've got open, well-defined, you know, uh, interfaces to our products. So it's very easy for us to integrate to other people as well as people to integrate to us. Gotcha. And obviously it seems like with this open nature you guys do have and kind of your work with a lot of different vendors out there, it seems to really work well with this new movement towards the virtualized environment, which a lot of operators are moving towards now which is kind of keen on, on you know, being able to, for operators to pick and choose who they want uh, for, their, for their services. And, and obviously in a, virtualized platform, in a virtualized environment, it should make it really easy for them to do that. I guess as we move towards this for telecom operators and the mobile operators out there, uh, I guess what impact are you seeing out there for operators? And, and how do you guys, I guess, approach uh, what they need or what their needs are in terms of their service assurance platforms? Yeah, so um, the impact is huge. And I think um, that the, imp the gap that the customers have in their OSS is really bigger than we thought back in 2012 when network functions virtualization first arrived on the scene. Yeah. Um, so if you look at what's gone on in the industry, um, Etsy has turned up with uh, this definition around something called MANO, mm -hmm. Management and Network Operations, that's supposed to really uh, help you, in particular on the assurance side, so gathering the EMS events, doing closed loop automation and healing within that virtualized environment. The problem is, is that by Etsy Mano's own uh, definition and specification, they are only a domain manager for this new virtualized network. They don't consider the physical network that all of the carriers have been operating forever, and frankly, that the carriers aren't going to turn off, you know, when they turn NFB on. So while we did spend uh, a lot of time, energy, and money uh, driving Etsy specifications in Mano, at the same time, um, we were considering what we call hybrid operations. 
So we have um, an assurance product, uh, actually, and I would say it's a, a joint assurance and fulfillment, but really it started from the assurance side of things mm -hmm. that straddles across the physical network, so the standard operations, as well as the hybrid operations that are occurring in the virtual network. And really what it does is it allows you to do those um, closed loop operations and the end to end service operations across the physical network functions, as well as the virtual network functions. And we feel like that that's gonna be a really key differentiator for us. And you will see that we have modified almost every one of our assurance components so that they fit up underneath this service director umbrella and work equally well in the uh, standard operations domain and the NFV operations domain. Makes sense. And obviously, I mean, it seems like working in that hybrid environment is going to be key. I know talking to operators myself, uh, that's one of their largest concerns going forward is, you know, they do have these legacy systems that have been operating for 10, 20, 30, 40 years uh, that have been working great and doing what they needed to do. Uh, but there is this new environment and it's, you know, that it's that transition period, which, you know, could be five, 10 years really uh, before you make this full migration where you've got to support the old and the new. And obviously it sounds like you guys have enough history in the legacy operations. And again, with your software background, obviously too, and, and the new stuff as well, that it does seem like you guys have a pretty good, uh, uh, you're in a pretty good position to kind of really see what's happening and be able to kind of really target what operators uh, need out there. Yeah, I, I think we really are in a good position. Um, and we bring more than just telecom experience yeah. to the table. So, you know, HP Enterprise, you know, we're the largest IT supplier on the globe. And we've had um, OSS components for the IT side of the business for quite a while. Uh, lots of, you know, probeless um, uh, monitoring and management, um, lots of orchestration, and we've been able to combine that expertise for both the IT cloud world, bring it together with our telecom expertise, and really start to put together um, uh, a portfolio of offers that really are going to help carriers through this transition. You know, it's, it, it's interesting. Um, when we started this journey about, well, it's been about four years ago now, mm -hmm. I had this mistaken impression that this was the inflection point <laughs> that was going to cause the carriers to actually have to do the OSS monitorization that everybody's been talking about. For <laughs> and what I found out after four years of this is it's really wrong. It's not a transformation. It's yet again, another evolution <laughs> that, you know, the carriers are going to go uh, through. And, you know, we're just trying to be at the forefront of that and do it in, um, a really logical stepwise manner that doesn't break what they have, uh, abstracts value out of what they have, doesn't break their wallet as they head towards, you know, the destination and helps make them be more competitive with the over the top players that have been providing these cloud like services for a number of years already. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you guys are obviously targeting uh, both the operations guys, the financial guys and the, and the marketing people, I'm sure at all these operators with, you know, with the you're able to offer. So, uh, I'm sure for them, that's got to be a very uh, easy or easy way to work with you guys. So uh, it sounds good that way. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Well, I guess so you guys look, look ahead a bit. And again, we're, we are kind of uh, in the early stages of the kind of this transition to uh, this new virtualized world. I guess, what do you see as maybe some of the challenges that you guys might, you know, see in the marketplace in terms of continuing this, uh, this evolution towards uh, the, these new platforms and new systems out there? What do you guys see as being, uh, you know, kind of uh, causing uh, maybe some, some long weeks for you guys? Yeah, so I think I'll try to bucket them into top three. Okay. Um, it, I would say bucket uh, challenge number one is how badly we've failed in agility over the last 20 years. I mean, if you look at KPIs for today, if we can get a, a new service into market in nine months, that's a huge win. True. And um, once a service has been instantiated um, from fulfillment, if in assurance we can actually uh, make uh, closed loop uh, responses back to the fulfillment environment out of assurance to, to provide some sort of flexibility to that service, 30 days is considered to be, you know, fast. Mm -hmm. and, and the new world that we live in, you know, we just – we can't have that. I mean, we've got to have agility 
down to days. I mean, we have to have a much tighter DevOps CI/CD model. And, um, you know, from a perspective of service flexibility, take something like virtual CPE. Mm -hmm. If someone wants to add um, a firewall to DNS and routing, we, we need to be able to do that in four minutes, not in 30 days. You know, that's what the market, the competitive nature of the market is demanding. Yeah. So I see that as challenge space uh, number one. Um, challenge space number two, I, we believe very strongly that you have to have um, an end-to-end -end visibility of all of our operations. And that's a huge challenge right now. Um, and we believe it's kind of driven by one central thing, and that is no real... Um, verifiable centralized authority of truth in an inventory that describes the current state of the network. Um, we find over and over again, you can probe the network and you come back with answers um, that differ from what, what a particular solution architect put into the system. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we're really working hard on making sure that you can get accuracy associated with the legacy physical network as well as the emerging virtual network and use that uh, inventory to uh, help you with your catalog and your set of offers to provide, you know, end-to-end -end visibility of service operations so that you know what parts of your network and services are functioning properly and what parts are impacted. So I would bucket that into challenge number two. And then challenge number three is um, it's all about changing the paradigm of the way that people work as we have the network and the IT environment clash. Um, you know, we've had this um, world where you had the router guy or you had the HSS guy or, you know, pick your network element. Um, and even in IT, you had the storage guys and the switch guys and the server guys. And, you know, that's not gonna work anymore. You've gotta have shared infrastructure and then you've got to have domain experts um, that have the ability to utilize the shared infrastructure that's underneath them. Um, and, and frankly, from an industry perspective, we need to provide better tools for these guys to uh, do their jobs. So clash of network IT, you know, putting together um, a much more flexible and efficient way to do operations within the network. Um, we think it's going to be critical as a matter of fact, we've been in, investing a lot in that space. So we have some unique IP that we have built uh, in our assurance environment that we call the Dynamic Descriptor Engine. And what it does is it's model-based, and we build models for all sorts of different scenarios within the network. And then rather than describing um, a service designer or a uh, an EMS system describing uh, what is going on in the network or what you want to do, you, or I'm sorry, the how, mm -hmm. that backwards. instead of describing the how mm -hmm. uh, to get something done and writing, you know, huge long XML scripts and all this kind of stuff. Um, what we do is we want to understand what your intent is. Yes. I want you know, a routing service with DNS and a spam filter and a firewall. Mm -hmm. and the dynamic descriptor engine does the work to actually, you know, generate all of the XML that's required to describe that service for the underlying um, pieces of either software or physical elements that need to be bolted together in order to deliver that service. So it can appear in the catalog and your customers can actually consume it. So we're really heading strongly towards that intent-based model. And we think that that intent base of having a dynamic descriptor engine and dynamic service descriptors is going to drive, you know, um, improvements in those three, you know, huge challenges that we see. Mm -hmm. um, you won't need, you know, you will improve agility greatly mm -hmm. if got the machine calculating for you how to do something and you just tell it what you want. 
um, you'll be able to manage the clash between the cultures if you've got a new paradigm and people don't have to be experts in legacy domains. Knowing how, you know, the how to do something, they can just tell the engine what, what they want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then, you know, we believe that that will really head us towards this evolution of um, a, a truly functional OSS and insurance model for, for all of our customers. Interesting. And again, there's so much happening in the market today, especially with mobile operators have to deal with increased data traffic and video and there's IOT coming down the road and whatever 5G is going to be. Uh, it seems like now is the time to kind of get started on this. And obviously I know for a lot of operators who are perhaps, you know, waiting to see what happens, there's probably a little nervousness there and jumping into it, but it seems like the technology at least is there. Uh, the vendor support is obviously there as well. It's just a matter of uh, just taking that first step and really kind of getting, getting the ball rolling this whole, this whole process. Yeah. You're spot on. The, the technology is there, although I won't, make any sort of claims that it's completely sure. sure. Uh, the, the business barriers are much more significant than the actual technology bar barriers that we're running into. Yeah. yeah, definitely still a lot happening there. Yeah, and it's funny. It, you know, it's, it can be things as simple as, um, so one situation I've run into here recently, I'll just do a little storytelling. Um, we have a customer. And they have decided that IT will be responsible for all of their virtualization infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And in the IT world, um, you never provide root access to your, um, you know, your server farm to anybody. You give them something called sudo or, you know, sued root access um, if they need to do a very particular function, but most of the time they just want you to tell them what you want and then they'll go do it for you. Well, in the new world, you know, we would want to have an orchestrator have privileged access so that it could actually go make a change based upon what it sees happening in the assurance environment. I mean, that's part of closed loop automation, zero touch. And they're kind of like, no, 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 we're uncomfortable with that. We want to have a button to push, <laughs> you know, when you tell me that there's something that needs to be automated. So we still have a ways to go. <laughs> That's an interesting story to hear because, again, we hear a lot about, you know, just the, the, the guys who are used to working on the hardware side of things. For them, it's a huge change as well because, again, it's all software now. But to also hear all the software guys who are also struggling. Uh, it's good to hear. I mean, it is, it is, there are still some challenges out there that need to be worked through. But it seems like the pace of that working through these problems is quickening and people are getting on board. It seems faster. So it is, it does seem like it's moving at, at, a, at a fairly good clip at this point. It, it is moving at a clip. And I, and I think it's, um, you know, that's driven by the competition. Yeah. And, uh, you know, these guys desperately need to figure out how to not be a pipe anymore and become as relevant to their customers as, uh, you know, Google and Facebook are to theirs. Yep, that makes sense. Makes sense. Well, hey, Jeff, definitely appreciate the insight. Obviously, HP's got a lot going on there in terms of this movement towards other virtualized platforms. And obviously, with the work on legacy systems, too, you guys have a lot of history there as well. So, uh, but it's great to get some insight from you guys as well. And good luck going forward with all that. But uh, thanks for the time today. We, we definitely appreciate it. You bet. Thank you very much for the time. It was good to talk to you. All right.